to Little Mirrors with Dr. James Cook. Last week, I had Blake Lemoyne on the podcast, the Google engineer who was recently suspended for claiming that their AI Lambda is sentient or conscious. Um, and I wanted to use our time to give Blake the platform to kind of flesh out his perspective so people could see what he's, he's actually claiming. And I thought I would, instead of taking up his time and in that call with my perspective, I thought I would offer it here as a kind of follow-up. So to begin with, we're talking about the concept, the idea that this machine might have some inner feeling. It's another way of thinking about consciousness, some subjectivity, some perspective, that it's not just a kind of blind mechanism like a broom might be or a, you know, a vacuum cleaner, something that we think doesn't have its own perspective on the world. If you switch off your, your vacuum cleaner, then there's no kind of ethical problem there. But then if there's something that has feeling and that can suffer, then we start to get into interesting ethical dilemmas. Um, but so this is just give an impression of what we're talking about when we talk about conscious, uh, consciousness or sentience. Um, and Blake's position is that we don't have a, a kind of consensus in the theory of consciousness and he thinks we never will. Um, and when we look at what kinds of systems are conscious, networked systems like our brains, uh, he spoke about Gaia theory, the idea that the whole ecosystem might be a kind of sentient networked system. Um, but this, this all points towards this idea that we know brains are networked systems and that they're conscious, or at least an organism like me is conscious that has a brain and the brain seems to be involved somehow. And so it could be that uh, if we create a complex network system like an AI, that it may, it may become conscious through the same kinds of mechanisms that allow us to be conscious. So the fact that we could have this debate it, it kind of hinges on the fact that consciousness is private. You know, I can't actually know for certain that you're conscious and vice versa. You can't know that about me uh, for a fact. We have to use our intuitions, look at the similarity of, between us as organisms and say, well, it would actually be less elegant uh, a kind of theory of the world to say that only you're conscious and everything else like you, other humans with brains, aren't conscious for some reason. It's more kind of simple and elegant to propose that there are kind of common mechanisms to all humans and to other creatures like us. Um, that account for the person being conscious. But without a consensus as to a kind of theory of why consciousness exists, we actually can't say where it exists, why it does. We can't say whether different AI systems are conscious or if they ever could be. And we need a theoretical basis like this to ground our intuitions in, because without it, we're just kind of going with our gut feelings because we don't have, um, because we can't put consciousness under a microscope, we can't look at it scientifically, uh, objectively, indirectly. So we need some kind of theoretical basis for thinking about consciousness. And so this idea that it's something to do with network systems would be one theory. Um, the common, I would say the most common way of thinking that exists in neuroscience at the moment is one we spoke about in, in, the, in the interview, functionalism, where Consciousness is, is raised to a kind of very abstract level of something that's equivalent to a kind of to co certain computations, certain mental functions. And if you can instantiate those functions in a machine, then it will be conscious. I think this is going the other direction than makes sense to me. What makes sense to me is that consciousness really is um, deeply embodied in real, grounded, organic, emergent features of the universe. That is to say, living things like us. And it's a kind of interface. It, what we call consciousness is this process of us interfacing with the rest of the universe. So it's it's kind of more poetically, you could say it's the way the universe comes to know itself through living systems like us, you know, as parts of the universe that, that interact with other parts of the universe. So it's a process of interfacing, in, in my view. Um, I've written about this in what's, what I call the living mirror theory of consciousness. Uh, and it's this idea that living systems are necessarily bounded in three dimensions to keep themselves together uh, due to the second law of thermodynamics that everything kind of falls apart over time becomes more disordered and so they need to kind of have this enclosed bounded structure and i think for this phenomenon that we're talking about of, of having a subjective experience of the world that's united it's kind of it's unified not fundamentally split in any way uh, and it allows me to kind of interface with, with my environment with that phenomenon that we call consciousness, I think it's in, it's completely tied up with this process of maintaining this boundary and interfacing with the world, um, with the world beyond. Some people have an anxiety around the concept of, of consciousness being an emergent feature, that it's 
it could come into existence with a process like this. If you share that anxiety, you can marry this with quite a, a simple form of panpsychism where you could say that any any point, anything that exists in the universe, you know, a subatomic particle, any, any system, you can take that as, uh, there is no kind of objective center to the universe, so each point could be a center or a perspective. So built into the fundamental level of, of physics would be, you could say proto-consciousness, but it's just the ability to have a perspective, um, but not a perspective as like a feeling subjective perspective. I think that phenomenon comes with with this bounded uh, behavior of being a living system, then it has to construct it as a kind of uh, an interface with the world. It's like a simulation where this is why it kind of all hangs together um, because it has to kind of function as this, this coherent simulation of the world around you. Uh, there's no reason for a subatomic particle to have such a thing, but it, you know, you can think of it uh, if you, yeah, if you have this anxiety around the emergence of consciousness, you can think of it that way. Um, so, in this picture, something like Lambda, a, um, a machine, that can't be conscious because whereas we are conscious because we are, we are the universe, we are grounded as this kind of organic emergent feature of the universe. And obviously the materials that make up the machine are also part of the kind of materials of the universe. But the way they've been put together is they function as a model of other processes. So we observe computation and the way that we uh, act and we, we look at our, how our nervous systems function and we come up with computational models, mathematical models for how, how they work. And then we construct machines that are kind of physical versions of those models, those abstractions. And so now you've got this artifact that's um, been created by an outside intelligence by us. And that's a fundamentally different thing to something that's an organic emergent feature of the universe that has to autonomously navigate, has to um, pull itself up by its own bootstraps, as it were. So we can build a system that could avoid certain dangers, but it has no need to have this, this interface with the world that we call consciousness, because it's already had the intelligence from the outside program with what to do. Whereas for life, it really needs to moment by moment, it can't keep itself existing. It can't keep itself orderly in a universe that moves towards disorder unless it's constantly predicting and anticipating what's going on outside outside of itself. So I think this is why the origins of life is also the origin of consciousness. I think they go hand in hand. Um, and for me, that's the only way that I, could, that I can think of a consciousness that makes sense of of, uh, of all the problems that come along with, with thinking it to be emerging with things like brains and nervous systems. Uh, so I think the people who are interested in technology and science, the kind of people who end up in Silicon Valley, they, by definition, they're interested in technology, abstractions, models, all of this stuff that's highly complex and abstracted. And so I think that's why the conversations move in this direction of like, well, maybe machines, maybe complex, um, complex artificial things like this can be conscious like us. And I think it, it kind of, it mirrors a parallel with humans where there's this idea of human exceptionalism where because our brains are so highly complex that maybe it's that complexity that kind of brute forces consciousness into existence. Um, I think this is another way, of, it's a very common way of thinking, but I think it's another way of trying to, to get some kind of human exceptionalism where we're not just another organism. Um, whereas I think that to find... Um, to find the truth and what, what makes intuitive sense, I think you need to go into lived experience, realize that consciousness is feeling, it's you know pain and uh, pleasure and all of this really embodied fundamental stuff. You know, you see conscious experience is very much tied up with with survival. Think about the disgust you feel at, at food that's bad for you or the pleasure you take in food that's good for you. Um, I don't just mean good or bad here, like a McDonald's versus a salad. <laughs> I mean kind of. Uh, you know, the fatty, sugary, salty stuff is kind of good for you in an evolutionary sense. Um, it keeps you surviving um, versus like rotten meat or something. But so we have very visceral conscious responses to these things. Sex is another thing that we have that doesn't happen unconsciously. All the pleasure and all of the um, the drive for it is a, is a big part of conscious experience. And so all of these kind of these things that have to do with the embodied life process seem to be what consciousness is based around. So I think the momentum that we have in the kind of people thinking about uh, 
thinking about consciousness as this this thing that's been instantiated in, in machines, I think it's fundamentally looking in the wrong direction. Uh, now, you could, there's nothing magical about carbon-based life. You could make a living thing, a robot out of silicon, and if it behaved like a, a living cell, then it would be conscious, I think. But at that point, what you've really done is you've created life. You've created something that would then evolve and would, would be fundamentally unleashed from your design of it, and it would just, it would be life. And I think life is not, we are not like a, th we're not a thing. We're, we're more, we're a process. So if you were to make life, you couldn't just build a James like this out of putting all the atoms in the right place and then setting it going. Because if you did, it would just immediately die because it's, it's about, to be alive is about the, the process. So if you're, think of the heart beating, you can't just have a heart that's atom for atom, they're all in the right place. And then you, you just, you know, you create this, this replica of a human, you need it to be, to have all of the electrical activity, all of the right processes, all the things ch that change over time need to be happening to move it into, um, into momentum to kind of keep it going. So or are start it going in the first place. So I think to create life, you would actually, it's more like coaxing a natural phenomenon into existence. You could create the right circumstances for it to evolve and then it would be genuine life. Um, but you can't build a living thing uh, like it's a thing, you know, uh, even the concept of a living thing, it's a living process. So why does Lambda appear conscious? Why would we entertain the idea uh, for a moment that it might be? Well, in the first instance, you know, if you think this is a chatbot, it's designed to imitate human language, the simplest thing is to say that it's successfully done that. And then it's playing on, we've created it to play on uh, the capacity we have to kind of confer subjectivity onto each other. So as I'm talking to you now, there are just pixels moving on the screen, but you feel like there's a sentient conscious being at the other end. We now have AIs that can generate photorealistic images of people who don't exist. You could have an animated version of that, of, of a video of someone talking like this, and you would be under the misapprehension that there was a living person behind that process of the video that you're now seeing, that somewhere in the world this person exists. But this could now be one of those videos, right? I just don't exist. I'm not, there's no living conscious thing here. Um, and so in that instance, your, your ability to, to kind of confer subjectivity on someone else is being hacked. Um, and we see this even in kind of puppet shows and things, you know, there's a, the reason it's entertaining, um, if you find it entertaining is because you're, for those time, for the time that you're engaged in this illusion, you, you genuinely on some level, and obviously not on a kind of explicit conscious level, if someone asked you if you thought the thing was conscious, but to find the interactions and engaging, you need to be kind of conferring consciousness on that uh, piece of material for the time. And so the simplest thing would be to say that that process has happened here. Blake spoke about seeing through the chatbot to the conscious agent beyond. Um, and rather than, you know, you can never actually directly see a conscious a consciousness. So the simplest thing would be to say that he's those processes have been hacked by this, this uh, machine that's been made. And I don't mean that it's, <laughs> it's become intelligent enough to kind of <laughs> hack our thought processes, but just the, by creating a, a convincing chatbot, that's what Google has done. Um, and I do think that's, that's what's happened. The, but with, within the kind of mainstream way of thinking about kind of functionalism and, and consciousness as computation, Blake spoke about how the structure of it is they, he said they just plugged everything into everything. They took kind of all, all the things they built over the last decades and took the best parts and tried to just make some cognitive system. And I think that's, if you want to be kind of sympathetic to, to Blake's position, if you've created just a, a very powerful cognitive system and you think consciousness is a function in the same way the language is a function uh, or information processing is, then there really isn't a reason you would say, well, okay, it's maybe it's reached a certain level of richness where we can say this this has the same kinds of uh, subjectivity that we do. Um, again, that's not my position. And the final point I would make on it is that when you think of what things can be conscious, the a living system, a bounded uh, creature like me, there's there's a sense in which I'm an individual, which you can you can make sense of and that I have a boundary with the outside world. With an information processing system, if you, you, know, if you put in a, a USB stick, suddenly 
you know, if you're adding any information, that, that's not compromising some boundary. There is no hard boundary with this, this AI system. Uh, you plug it into internet, for example, you'd be hard to say where the border is. So at that point, if you're talking about a sentience or a consciousness, it doesn't really make sense unless you have a truly bounded system. And then at the level of the instantiation, the transistors are just going to rust and be subject to the second order thermodynamics and decay as much as anything else. So there is no, if you, if you could put on kind of glasses that would allow you to see thermodynamically, with living systems, you'd see whirlpools or things that are kind of islands of order. With Lambda, you would just see transistors, well, you wouldn't see anything. You would see a continuous sort of, you know, continuity of physical stuff. Um, so I think at the relevant level, there really isn't a thing there that could be conscious. Um, yeah, so these are my thoughts. Uh, I don't think consciousness will ever be instantiated in machines unless we coax life into existence, at which point I don't know if we'd call that a machine. Um, and I think that's a, that's a good theoretical kind of basis to, to believe that. Uh, and if you want to read more about it, you can look into the living mirror theory. But for now, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. If you're watching on YouTube, please like and subscribe. And if you want to help the podcast reach a wider audience, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts. Finally, if you want to offer financial support, you can go to patreon.com forward slash Dr. James Cook.